All right, uh, let's dive right in here, uh, ready to get started. Uh, so thanks everybody who uh, showed up on time and, and uh, uh, we're gonna jump right in. I, I wanna thank everybody for coming in. I know that we're probably far enough into COVID that everyone's suffering from a little bit of uh, webinar exhaustion here. Uh, I know certainly I am. Uh, so, so we appreciate you making the time uh, to talk to us today and, and to be a part of this. Uh, you're joining us for episode number seven of The Future of Freight, which is a fancy way to say that it's just fun for me to talk to people who understand logistics technology and, and kind of want to get deep in the weeds. I don't have any pretense that this is a topic that millions of people around the world are very animated about. I know when I tell my friends what I do, they sometimes threaten to walk out. But what's fun is that uh, we have a, a great group of people here that are actually excited about words like OCR and RPA and, and integrations, uh, and especially Jenna. Um, Jenna, thank you so much for joining us uh, here today. Thank you for having me. No. <laughs> so I'm so like, wow, proud of these interests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry to, sorry to start off by saying that we're all a very, very boring crew, but I, I think we, we find passion in what we do. Of course, um, I'm joined here today by Jenna Brown, who is the CEO and co-founder of Shipamex. Um, Jenna, why don't, why don't you just start off for a minute by, by telling us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Shipamex. Yep. Um, so, hey, I'm Jenna. I, I started Shipamax uh, just, just over four and a half years ago. Um, I, I've had a kind of a, a varied journey um, so far. I actually started working out in kind of more um, a commodity trading environment and moved into tech startups before, before starting Shipamax. Um, the company itself, so we are a toolkit for, for automating data entry. Um, so, for example, let's say you get sent a bill of lading. Um, uh, we can extract the data and send you essentially a clean structured data feed that can be imported into your TMS or ERP. Um, and the, the solution we provide is, is kind of full service. So there's no need to set up um, rules, templates. We've got integrations out of the box and a set of kind of user interfaces that are designed specifically for logistics workflows. Awesome. Okay, yeah, and, and, and I think all those things are things that we want to really dive deep into during the course of this conversation. Um, in, in retrospect, I'm thinking we should have come up with bingo cards for, for acronyms uh, that people could use to drink shots every time we say uh, the right combination of acronyms. But, but yeah, I, I think this is, this is like really interesting stuff because I think almost every logistics provider or carrier that we speak to uh, really discusses the need to get their hands around, wrapped around data and just trying to figure out what it is and probably most importantly, how to turn things that aren't really structured data into structured data. And, and, and I think it's just such a pertinent topic to talk about. Uh, just a, a really br brief intro or reminder to, to people about what Fredos does and why this is something we like to talk about. Um, Fredos Group as a whole runs a bunch of different solutions. I think the two most pop uh, commonly known ones are Fredos.com which is an online marketplace connecting dozens of forwarders with uh, over 100,000 importers worldwide. And we also run Web Cargo, which is a suite of tools like a freight rate management platforms, online sales capacity, and then connectivity between airlines and freight forwarders. And, and really one of the biggest challenges, and why I'm, I'm so excited to see more companies and companies like Shipmax in this space, is, is that getting different types of companies to speak to each other uh, has been such an, a massive challenge with, within the industry, and, and it's really exciting to see. And and just a reminder, I usually start off by saying this, but these conversations are really fun because it becomes a conversation. So I, I want to urge everybody, if you have questions, if you have comments, please drop them in the chat, drop them in the Q&A. We'll be taking a look at them and, and trying to be as responsive uh, as we can. Uh, I, I'm going to start off really just by, by kicking off this crazy fact that I heard from, uh, we run an annual conference called Freight Tech, or at least we did pre-COVID. We'll see what happens afterwards. Um, and, and we had a, um, Daniel Mast from Maersk from Tradelands, who was talking a little bit about what Maersk does. And one of the coolest stats was that every day, a Maersk ship generates about 20 gigabytes of data, We're kind of measuring what the water temperature is and, and uh, a lot of different parameters, really. Uh, and, and that's an awesome reflection of what IoT is, right? The fact that Right now, there's a lot of things that are happening in the real world, hardware changes, a container moves from A to B. It's relatively easy to think of a sensor that you can put on that in order to measure it, in order to turn that into something that makes sense. Uh, you know, from a freight forwarder's perspective, it's where is this pallet right now? Is the temperature correct? Uh, is it a jar? Is it, is, it, um, is it held at the right angle? 
pushing that into a system and then making sure your buyer can see it or making sure you can analyze it. And, and I guess the first question that I wanted to kick this off with, uh, Jenna, if, if we shift away from that IoT vision of there's hardware, let's track it. And you know, the, the common cliche that data is the new oil, what is the data that you feel like people are missing out on and that people need to start paying attention more to in order to get more value out of it? Yeah, I, I do think the answer for this is, is different for every company. Um, what I kind of usually say is, um, if there are key parts of your value-added service as a forwarder uh, or other provider, that could be enhanced by better access to data. Let's kind of focus in on that. So there are maybe three ways I see companies start approaching us. Um, I guess one, uh, how do you kind of strengthen one of your differentiators? Um, or two, how do you improve an area of weakness that, that you have? Or three, actually, um, maybe you just want to automate an area that is a, a pure cost you and will never be a, a differentiator to your service. Um, so one of the kind of interesting examples I'm hearing people talk about is, let's say you've got a large client and they really value your you know, purchase order, uh, management, SKU level traffic tracking, have a look at, you know, how does your data flow for, for those services and are there, there are improvements there? And I think once you really get to grips with, you know, what are those areas and how much is there actually to gain from, from improving the data flows or lose if you don't and someone else improves it more than you, then you can kind of look at a little bit more, more from that, that viewpoint. Are there, I, I like that, that breakdown of the three different topics because I think 20 years ago, IT at logistics companies was really about where can I save money by scaling more efficiently. And I think the first two things that you talked about, competitive differentiators or, or playing catch up on things that are broken right now, more and more that's about better customer interactions, right? Yeah. Is, is there any particular area that jumps out to you where customer interactions can become much better with standardized data? I mean, actually, the, just that example I, I kind of gave you before. So SKU level tracking. Um, let's say if you are if you're a forwarder and you are providing, you know, your customer provides you PO data, you send back um, the SKUs that are actually shipping. That process right now, okay, not only is it insanely costly, but because it's very time consuming, probably the amount of errors you are sending to your customers is, is quite high. Um, and, you know, if you're sending them uh, inventory data that is incorrect, that is ultimately resulting in a pretty poor service. So I think that's an interesting example because it's one, how do you provide a better service to your large clients? But two, when those services are um, inherently expensive um, to provide, is there a, a kind of way of automating that allows you to provide that service to a wider set of customers that you wouldn't have been able to um, otherwise? Mm -hmm. so, so with that in mind, do you see the standardization really about, or or I, I guess the data structuring. Do you see that more as a way to make things move smoother or are there additional ancillary values that you get? I mean, for, you know, the, the thing that pops out to me is that any tech company right now basically collects data for data's sake, right? The more data that I have, the more value I can come up with, the more insight I can come up with. What do you think is the main driver for logistics providers, let's say carriers or forwarders really, that are now structuring data. Do you think there's more to gain from the insights from the data they manage to structure for their own purposes or in those interactions? Where, what should be they be indexing on? I'm personally more bullish on, less on like insights. I, I, I think there's a lot of noise around insights. Um, and of course, I'm sure there is interesting stuff you can do with that. Um, I'm more bullish on um, the experiences you can provide to customers. And I do think that's very different depending on the workflow you're talking about. Um, uh, there, there can be examples of insights you can get um, that may also help you improve operational flows. Um, yeah, but I think in general, I'm more bullish on how you reduce manual admin spend on things and how do you improve the communication back to your clients because ultimately that, that's what's going to make them come back. And it, it, so thanks for that. It, it, does that mean that the right way to approach coming up, if you're looking at your existing logistics business, that the right way to really approach, what do I try to standardize or structure first? 
is where am I spending the most time? Is that like the number, like what's your favorite question to ask a customer when you first sit down with them? Um, oh, I think, I think there are so many questions uh, to <laughs> dig into to really figure this out. Um, it, it can be, you know, I, th I think with everything it's, you know, where can you save the most time versus the ease of automating something. Um, so some of the highest value pieces can also be the, the most disruptive in the organization. So you actually might, and especially if this is something new you're embarking on, you actually might want to pick something that's uh, kind of easier, that maybe a team is overwhelmed or whatever it is to, to prove it before your organization takes that jump for, you know, the, the big kind of hairy project. Um, so I think, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. I think when clients come to us, they will usually have quite a good idea of their priorities, um, which can be based both on strategic things as well as, um, you know, things they are absolutely struggle, struggling with right now in the business. Cool. And, and from a nuts and bolts perspective, this type of solution would not be something that's really ever customer facing, right? This, like in, in a perfect world, I'm, I'm correct me if I'm wrong. Would a customer ever know that they're using, would a logistics provider's customer ever know that they're using a tool like Ship Mac? Um, probably not. Um, there are customers that are looking, you know, I guess there's been a big pull recently for customers to create their own web portals and things like that and they're opening up some of that data um, live to their end clients. I know some people are feeding some of that data there um, mm -hmm. but um, most likely they wouldn't probably know that we're behind it. Awesome. Back end magic. That's cool. And, and you know you mentioned the word customer portal and, and this takes me back to something that you and I were emailing back and forth a little bit about where I, I kind of see this whole area of structuring communication right? because that's effectively what a lot of these tools do. Will they take unstructured uh, communication, like an email, uh, whether it's a request for a quote or where's my shipment, and then turn that into a structured request that you could then respond to automatically. And, and it seems to me that there's two different approaches to that, where option one is let a customer communicate with me by whatever. It could, it could be anything from, from an Instagram chat or WhatsApp uh, to a, a TikTok video, and you convert that into an inbound query for, for your TNS or for your ERP. Whereas the other option is never even give them the ability to send you an email and just create a portal that structures it from the get-go. Uh, and they, they seem to me like kind of attacking the same problem from two different directions. Let's keep everything structured. Let's keep everything streamlined. Do you see those as polar opposites or am I just kind of making up that, that spectrum? Um, I don't think they have to be, you know, no, I, I think maybe I'm more in the first camp. So I think this is maybe the camp of like, um, of Brian from kind of chain IO who basically says like let your customers your suppliers you know anyone you engage with let them send you those data or requests in whichever way they want to and um, I guess your your kind of job ultimately as a service provider is to be able to to handle that um, and now what all these kind of nice technology pieces can do at the other end is like how do you take all that different noise in different shapes and sizes and translate it into the thing that you need for your internal systems. I think that that's how I would go about it. Cool. Yeah. And, and I love that. That's, that's a great, and you know, I've spoken to Brian about this as well. And I really think that it's a great, it's a great uh, approach to it. Uh, we're, we're really, it, it ends up becoming just this, this magical kind of transformative mirror where it takes anything that, you know, anything that comes into it, it can turn into your specific shape, which is really interesting. Uh, you know, using that as a jumping off point for the next uh, question, actually, so, you know, Chain.io, which is an integrator, right, that did, basically does technology integrators, and I guess Shipamax, which integrates people with that same technology, uh, I guess, um, from two different perspectives, it's kind of hitting logistics at a really interesting point where historically, you know, you had your logistics software, maybe it was just a TMS, and then, you know, a bunch of spreadsheets or, or a bunch of a, a shared Microsoft uh, drive somewhere. And you've kind of had this like sassification, I don't know if I can say that, but more and more different SaaS tools that are slicing and dicing and unbundling the logistics ecosystem, where you might used to have this model with a company, and now you have a separate platform for customs and maybe for pricing and for shipment management and for visibility. It's really becoming a lot of different tools that are, top, that are all bundled on top of each other. 
And in order for them to talk with each other, it becomes really, really complicated, but also in order for the humans to interact with them, it becomes really complicated. And and I, I guess like with your front row seat into how this is all changing and speaking to so many technology logistics companies that are probably pretty gung-ho about technology, how do you see this direction evolving? Like, do you see us going back to a bundle like your Microsoft Office suite, but for international freight? Or do you think that there's going to be more separate in- internal systems at a freight forwarder or at a logistics provider, and they'll all be communicating with each other? What, what's your take on that? Good question. Um, so I think, I guess there's the, what's happening now, and the, part of that question is like, what's going to go happen with acquisitions, right? Because there are some companies, eating companies, uh, left, right, and oh center. Um, yes. So I think we're, we're definitely seeing more and more logistics organizations, I guess, move away from, let's say, bespoke on-prem um, systems towards that kind of cloud-based off-the-shelf solution. And I think a natural side effect of that is companies being able to be actually able to work with a more diverse set of systems because often the benefit of those cloud systems is they are a little bit easier to, to integrate and kind of accelerate that behavior. Um, I also think there's, there's a kind of an un- another underlying reason to that, which is as you're moving to these off-the-shelf systems, it's, it's very hard for any technology company um, to be number one at everything. Um, and actually, I think Eric um, was, Sarah Johnson was kind of posting uh, about this just a couple of weeks ago on, you know, uh, can you really have a, a TMS for, for everyone? And probably in actual fact, there are various different niches. Um, so I, I think I'm more towards the side of you will, companies will move towards best of breed systems. But I'm also very cautious that um, there are a couple of large players in the industry that are, um, I guess, creating their own portfolio of, of these companies to, to merge together. So, so we'll have to see whether they kind of remain separate or become some big, I don't know, uh, Microsoft conglomerate for, for logistics. Yeah. Um, I, I guess we'll have like our Microsoft versus Apple uh, versus Linux. Uh, um, from, from, from your side, do you feel that customers are coming in knowing what they want in terms of the ability for those for those platforms to speak to each other? Or is, is that even, uh, do a lot of the people that are procuring this type of software end up going to this, buying five or six different them, trying to figure out, okay, how can I duct tape these together to get that to actually work? Or, or do you feel like there's this conscious effort uh, to, to actually build up cohesive stacks, uh, whether they works or not? Um, I think, so I guess we usually only get pulled in on a very specific part of the conversation. Um, sometimes what I do see is, um, let's say if we're being compared against another um, kind of a provider that might not be logistics focused. Um, sometimes um, there hasn't actually been thought yet to how those systems are going to connect into um, you know the cargo wise or the day car or whatever, and um, we have to a little bit unwind from that because of course these systems they integrate very nicely to zero and your your Microsoft systems, but that that's quite a a messy uh, integration to now map it across to to a logistic system. So I think some I don't know whether it's always actively thought about or whether. Whether it's something, it's like, you know, we'll do it, we'll just fix it. And then we realize afterwards, actually, that's a probably five, six month project to, to really get it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see a comment coming in here about how uh, customers are heading to portals where they want the shipper to actually populate and, and save them data entry. But even though the data elements are mostly the same, and I think this is something that ShipMax is, is really, you know, kind of bullish on turning data elements into at least the same. Each UI is different becomes a nightmare to manage versus a nice uh, global API that everybody can feed. And I, I think that's an interesting point. Do, do you have a, do you kind of have an opinion on unified APIs or global APIs? Do, do you feel like logistics is ready for open AP, sets of APIs for, uh, APIs that, for everybody to work? Because my, my kind of gut sense has always been that every logistics company structures their data you know, so differently and, and has kind of pushed themselves into this, these like very specific you know, SQL databases that it's hard to come up with one specific API that fits. 
do you do you feel like we we might be moving in that direction or that it, it's likely um I think there's a difference between are we ready for open API versus are we ready for a um, a global data standard API? I don't think we'll ever be ready for a global <laughs> data standard um, API. Um, I think um, obviously open APIs are fantastic, and you know when I look at um, it, all these kind of different technologies coming together. Um, you of course come up against these problems like, okay, now I've got 10 APIs from my favorite shippers. How do I um, use them all without kind of causing pain? And I guess that's the nice thing about technology is it kind of actually creates and um, those new businesses. So like the chain IOs who go and connect that and then turn it into one. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm kind of, yes, ready for open API. <laughs> no standardization will just kind of fix those, those problems mm -hmm. with other bits of technology. On a meta level, um, it, it seems to me that the more data gets standardized, the more you know, it, it's potentially leveling the playing field. And, and I'm always scared of saying it, but almost commoditizing a lot of the types of services that logistics providers do provide. Do, yeah, I, I see you shaking your head. Like, yeah, do you, do you feel like that's the case? I mean, as things all gravitate towards do you provide customs, reverse logistics? You know, how can you spit that back into my ERP? D does that change the way that forwarders need to compete from your side? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think that better access to data is standardizing um, mm -hmm. forwarders. Um, obviously, I, I'm not a, uh, a customer of a forwarder. Um, but I'm trying to think of a good analogy, I think. I think there's so much more to providing a, a good service. And I think, you know, we can talk all we want about data, but logistics is inherently not about data. It's about moving physical things across the world and um, often having a, a kind of person to assure you and take control of that and fix it when there's problems. And um, I think no matter how good you get the data, you will always need that, that personal touch and that management. Hmm. I, I'm sure there's a bunch of people that are kind of applauding that answer right now um, <laughs> and, and kind of cheering because it's definitely a recurring theme here. You know, one of my favorite things, this is a big picture. I don't know um, how many people that are listening are, are familiar with this picture. Uh, you're looking at an Amazon snowmobile, uh, which, which, is, which is what they use. Uh, it, it's Amazon's most cost-effective way to move data right now. It's a 45 foot high cube container that can carry, um, I think it's a hundred million gigabytes of data. Uh, and it's a service that Amazon provides in order to, to move goods into, your, into AWS storage. Uh, and and we, we touched on this a little bit, but really on the SaaS side and on, on the B2B side, there's been this whole evolution of different companies like Zapier, which, which I'll you know, admit I, I use very, very frequently. Uh, every single person that registered for this webinar was pushed into our, our CRM using Zapier. Uh, or if this then that, or Integramet, and 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 really, you know, we started to talk about this a little bit, but getting a little bit into the weeds, for people listening to this call that are rolling out platforms, what are the biggest um, challenges for data integration? Whether it's integrating data from people, like what Chip Max would do, or from from other data sets or from other platforms, what are the the biggest kind of challenges and obstacles that you see companies needing to overcome in order to make that happen? Yeah. So, I mean, speaking from the integrations we do, um, maybe there's a couple of different areas. I think, um, one, when you integrate systems, there is actually a lot of business understanding needed. Um, so, a couple of examples of this. I guess, one, if, you, if we take um, a free-form address from, from a document, how do you understand that and map it into a company code in your TMS? Or if we're taking kind of free-form data, um, what's the actual underlying data structure of that? Should it be feeding into a system that has like consoles and shipments or something entirely different? Um, I think there's that underlying, I guess, business understanding you need to translate your data. Um, but I think the second thing that is maybe sometimes missed is that, and it actually comes maybe back to your point on APIs, um, you know, how do you create a really slick experience when data can't be matched or transferred? And um, I think, you know, messiness um, is the reality of logistics. 
and we actually don't live in a perfect world or of you know common data standards APIs. So you have to think about that experience when something goes wrong to make sure you're building a solution that your end users don't kind of feel and um, you know defeats the the purpose purpose when you actually implement it. I, yeah, that, that's that's actually awesome because to, to your, what you were saying before, for I think good freight forwarders are you know they, they provide an awesome experience ninety percent of the time or ninety five percent of the time, and and really the biggest challenge and what people fight over is is the exception management and how do I turn that other five percent? And I always think of it like just like a basic probability game. If you have six different people involved in a in a um in, a, in any given shipment. And each person along that chain has a you know 2.5 percent chance that something will get screwed up in, in that shipment. If there's six people, then there's only 15 percent chance that that shipment will actually go under well. So, and and what you just said there, which was so interesting, is is that you kind of have to treat data the exact same way, which is that you know you're handling your shipments, trying to figure out how do you deal with like the other five, the five percent that'll screw up, and you have to do the exact same thing with data. How do you actually do that? Do you put the onus on the the kind of the, the shipper or on the logistics provider in order to, to clean up that data or to try to categorize it better? Um, I don't think it's about like categorizing and clean it, cleaning up. It's like that data is there. It's, it's been tried to send, been sent from A to B and that hasn't worked. So, so what happens? And um, I think different providers have different ways of doing this. And um, I can talk about it with, with the context of shipper max. So, um, Let's say when we are processing a document, um, we get the data, we understand what it means, uh, we structure it, we send it into the, the ERP. And perfect world, you will never see us like exist, basically. But um, as we know, <laughs> logistics is, is uh, not so perfect. Um, so there might be a number of reasons we get an exception. Um, in our case, we have just a super sing like simple kind of ticketing experience, if you like, which basically says, hey, here's all the, the documents that didn't go through and then you can click on it. Here's the document, here's what we extracted, here's why it got rejected. And um, it allows that, that human person to, to deal with that. Um, that's, I guess, one example of how you can solve that. And then that, for us, that interaction takes about 14 seconds to, to resolve on average. Mm -hmm. um, other systems I know um, uh, uh, will have different portals where they kind of tell you all the messages that failed and it might be more IT experience. So I think it's very system specific, but I guess my point is like, you have to have a way to handle that, which is not, oh, you just need better data because um, you're probably not gonna get it. Great, yeah, and I think it's such an important lesson on the data side and, and really logistics technology in general, which is you have to optimize for your happy flow, but make sure that you can solve for your, your sad flow. Um, so, so moving on here, this is kind of one, one, one last major question here. You know, I, I spend a lot of time just like looking up at, you know, different companies and how they're dealing with technology. And, and just one recent thing that I came across, which was such an interesting contrast with Kuninago, who I think have always done a very good job at, at automation. Uh, and, and not going into their specifics, this is from their uh, analyst 2020 half year briefing, but kind of talking about these like very basic things that they're doing, like document filing and, and where they want to optimize, you know, status updates, carrier communication. And of course, a lot of these have to do with both internal and external integrations. And then I also saw that they have a, a WeChat platform, uh, which, which for those who don't know is, is a very popular uh, chat app in, in Asia. And I'd never seen that they did that. Uh, and and I, thought, I thought it was pretty interesting. And then I was just kind of popped up in my head this question. You work constantly with different logistics providers. Uh, do you feel like there's any like one or two characteristics that they have that kind of set up differentiation between ones that are early adopters or strong users of logistics technology and those who are not particularly strong? Yeah, I can, maybe I'll, I'll give you kind of three, I guess the first one actually is probably more like table stakes. Um, but uh, I'm always really impressed when I go in and I speak to teams and there is clear ownership and process for identifying processes and um, quantifying the value of projects. Um, I think that's a kind of must have, but I, I guess it's kind of more table stakes in terms of mm -hmm. when you're really thinking about leadership. Um, I think um, second thing is the ability to question all previous assumptions. So sometimes we see culture and emotion has an overwhelming sway on decision making. Um, typical example of this is your company's attitude to, to build versus buy. 
Um, so it's, it's something I do uh, kind of internally here when I'm trying to push the team away from um, the constraints of, of what we've done before is kind of just say, you know, imagine if we didn't have that, that product or that team, um, how would you build that from scratch knowing what, what you know now? And if you actually go back to first principles, you will often get a very different picture. Um, you'll still then probably have to go and mix in um, the reality of today. But if you kind of go back from that kind of unconstrained view, you'll probably get a much healthier um, final outcome, which is less attached to that kind of emotion and, and sunk costs. Um, I think that's really important. And then the third thing, which is maybe like more controversial is like, um, I I'm think- I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think ability to have difficult conversations and make um, decisions that can feel radical. Um, so a classic example right now is um, cost cutting. Um, so most com uh, companies we actually speak to um, don't need to cut costs. They can shift resources, especially if they're growing. Um, but some do, and especially right now. Um, but often there is this like nervousness around having those discussions. And I appreciate that sometimes that is um, some of the hardest conversations you can have as a business. But sometimes you, you kind of see fear leading decisions. And I think it's very hard to be a tech leader if your decisions are constrained by, by fear. Right. Yeah, I, and, and I think it, it probably, I, I totally agree with that. I think it also gets worse in that typically if, if there's a decision point like that and you avoid making the decision, you're going to end up making that decision three or four years later, but it's going to have cost you a whole lot more. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know I, I see everything or a lot of things through the, through the prism of freight pricing and, you know, whether you're selling online or not. And I just remember when, you know, people first started talking about it a couple of years ago and there were some leaders that decided to do it and some that decided not to do it. And then, you know, suddenly people that were on the fence or were kind of doing it, but a little bit half-assed, suddenly find themselves playing catch up uh, because they were a little scared to make a decision early on. So yeah, I think such a great point. Um, I'm going to shift over to some questions that we got uh, in advance before, before we, uh, before uh, the, the, while we were, people were registering. So I think first question really quickly, how do you ensure data quality? I guess um, internally at a company. Yeah, we talked uh, about this a bit. But. Very broad question. Um, maybe in the context of us, so uh, one thing we do when we um, automate the processing is like we can give quite detailed reports on why things don't get processed straight through, um, and that can uncover operational issues that that are blocking operational uh, data quality. So, for example, you know, are certain suppliers missing always missing reference numbers? Are certain members of the team never putting accruals in the system? And um, so, I think it's um, maybe designing systems around that kind of unhappy use case. Cool. Okay, thanks. Now, this is my, my personally what I'm most passionate about. I actually awkwardly probably average uh, a, pie, a slice of pizza a day. So um, what's your favorite pizza topping? Uh, I think if the ingredients are good, margarita, um, you know, simple is best. But apologies to any Italians. I do love ham and pineapple as well. <laughs> okay, um, next question. Uh, can you focus on extracting pricing and, and how to make this usable for AI? We didn't even touch AI with, with so far, which is a little surprising. But yeah, I mean, yeah. anything on this? So this is probably not my sweet spot area. I, I haven't really looked at freight pricing because my understanding is that um, it's relatively structured data. And I think when you look at this, a lot of the work is in aggregating it, cleaning it, and being able to use it. Um, versus when I think about what we do is our kind of core competency is like when you have very messy, unstructured data. Um, so I think there's probably a few companies that really focus on that that might give you a little bit of better answer than I can. Okay. Yeah, now to turn this into, uh, not to create another competitor, but it's surprisingly unstructured. So yeah, maybe oh, one day okay. we'll, uh, we'll meet on the RFP side. Um, <laughs> I, I think we, we touched on this question a little bit. Do you have anything to add, else to add on this uh, from open source concepts in logistics? Yeah, I mean, so when I think of open source, I'm literally thinking like, here's the code, go use it. Um, I haven't actually heard of any really open source projects in, in logistics or any on my radar. Um, obviously, you know, in the wider tech space, you've got things like Loopback or, or TensorFlow. Um, actually, do you know any logistics open source? I, I mean, I know some data structures, right? Like DCSA putting together their standards for container shipping and, you know, track and trace. 
Uh, but but I think that a lot of them, it, it's really, it, it's slow. I mean, you know, even, even for standards, I always look at air cargo and, and kind of how long it takes IATA to push out new standards. They've, they've had this like e-booking, e uh, e-airway bill standard for, for over 10 years and they're only at like 70% penetration rate. Um, so yeah, I think I, my guess is that the real open source, unless a very large player, and this would probably have to come from carriers, uh, would want to create software to re to really standardize it. I think it would really be limited to data structures, is my guess right now. Um, are you a business book person? Any favorite favorite business books to recommend? Yeah, probably one of my favorite is um, "Hard Things About Hard Things" uh, by Hen Ben Horowitz. Um, mm -hmm. I think as a kind of relatively young leader. That, that kind of insight and experience is, is quite helpful for me. Awesome. And, and I just, just in, in the interest of time, I just want to get to this last question, which was really interesting for me. You started talking about this in the very beginning about pivoting from, from kind of working in the bulk market uh, towards, you know, general forwarding or logistics providers. Were there any key lessons that you picked up while you were doing that or, or any particular insight of what drove it? Yeah, I think just always being um, like brutally honest and, and challenging your own assumptions. So essentially what happened to us is, you know, we had an initial product, we'd sold it to an initial market, we had customers, and we weren't losing customers, but we realized our initial target market wasn't actually big enough for a VC back company. And so we had to look at the core technology we had built and understand, you know, why are people buying it? What's the actual value we're driving? Not what we want to drive to them. Um, and is there another subset of people that actually might find a similar value? And I think fortunately for us, we realized we could just kind of sidestep into container logistics and, um, you know, it was pretty happy days from there. Awesome. But yeah, it's great to hear. Um, yeah, Jen, any, any parting, parting words or thoughts on your side? Um, oh, uh, not yeah, I didn't, I didn't prep you for that. It's okay if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> not on top of my head. Okay. All right. Well, John, thank you so much for, for joining us. This, this was really so interesting um, from my perspective. I, you know, I, I know that there's a ton happening in this area. Uh, and, and you know, for those of you on the call, if you're, if you're, if you're not already structuring data um, from your customer engagement, highly, highly recommend that you head over to ShipMax's website, drop Jenna a line and, and talk to them about it, because I do think it's something super important. Um, right now, another just topical thing right now, just to, to kind of shill this away a little bit, uh, freight pricing continuing to rise. We put together some interesting insights around the actual supply and demand um, perspective of this, like why our prices actually continue to go up, and you can get that at freighters.com slash broken. Um, we'll be doing our next uh, webinar. We'll be in another couple uh, another couple of weeks. We'll be sending out an invite. We'll be with the former chief technology officer at Maersk, uh, who just finished a couple of his job a couple of months ago, talking about the evolution of carriers and how they've been uh, shifting, uh, kind of from being a, a monolithic carrier to a fully integrated service. Um, Jenna, thank you so much for joining us. This was really such a pleasure to talk about. Oh, no, thank you very much. Awesome. And, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great day. Bye.